Thank you to USC Institute of Armenian Studies for inviting me to speak here today and for bringing so many diverse uh, disciplines together. Today I'll be talking about the changing roles of Armenian churches. Slide, please. Next slide. <clears throat> Medieval churches extensively dot the Armenian landscape and are one of the most prominent symbols of Armenian history and heritage. It's easy to assume that these ubiquitous pillars of heritage are timeless and have experienced little change through the centuries. However, in this presentation, I want to critically analyze churches beyond an art historical purview, which tends to only look at form and function, and analyze churches as active physical spaces that have agency in impacting social, political, and economic networks of relations. Next slide. In order to trace this impact, I will outline the roles of churches in the medieval period and juxtapose them against roles in the Soviet and post-Soviet eras. In the medieval period, churches had multiple yet simultaneous functions. Perhaps their most obvious is their role as religious centers. Whether through a cross-domed architectural plan like on the uh, church of Surprerotsime to the left or through architectural decorations like God on the relief of the Gavit in Norvank, Churches were meant to act as imposing religious spaces that helped humans communicate with the divine. Next slide. Secondly, churches served as diplomatic spaces that mediated relations between the crossroads of peoples and kingdoms. It's uh, not surprising then that a lot of churches incorporated stylistic features from other cultures. Art historian Christina Maranchi notes how on the 7th century church of Zvartnots inside on the capitals, the commissioning Catholicos at the time, Nurses III, had his title and name written in Greek letters. Maranchi notes that this Byzantine stylistic flair was meant to accure favor from the Byzantine emperor at the time so that he could help send troops uh, to help Armenian troops defend against Arab invasing, invading forces. And also it was meant to legitimize the autonomy of the Armenian apostol apostolic church. So some churches then served as diplomatic mediators um, within powerful relations. Next slide. Finally, many religious complexes uh, produced a lot of contemporary knowledge. Uh, not only were monastic complexes home to famous universities like Tanahat Monastery here on the slide, which is the alleged home of Gladzar University, but many held scriptoria, which produced manuscripts and also libraries. So in the Soviet era, churches had multiple uses, and I want to point out that they were often simultaneous. So while one church was serving as a religious center, it could also have been uh, mediating diplomatic ties at the same time and producing knowledge. Um, next slide. In the late medieval period, with the invasion of foreign forces and the waxing and waning of Armenian principalities, Armenian churches lost their impactful social political roles. Yet medieval churches experienced an unlikely revival in the Soviet era where they took on divergent functions from the medieval period. But this revival seems quite peculiar when you juxtapose it against uh, Soviet restrictions and monitoring of religious practice. Take, for example, the 1929 Law on Religious Association, uh, which was active until 1920, 1990, and uh, only allowed religious groups to practice religious practice in specific registered buildings. This monitoring uh, can be seen in statistics and numbers produced in the Soviet era in 1972. There's only about 144 ecclesi ecclesiastical members serving a population of four Armenians in all of the Soviet Union. And furthermore, statistics from the late 1980s show that there are only 50 operating churches in Armenia, a number that went down to 33 um, in the whole of Armenia by 1991. So these laws and statistics make it seem that churches, especially medieval churches, were obsolete spaces. Next slide. Yet starting in the 1920s and reaching a peak in the 1970s and the 1980s, the Soviet government started to pour hundreds of uh, thousands of rubles into the annual, annual cleaning, restoration, and active reconstruction of churches. Um, Soviet state committees oversaw these projects and they planned to turn churches into secular hushartzan, which is Armenian for monuments, where they would act as museums to attract tourists. In fact, many of the churches you've visited throughout Armenia today were probably reconstructed in the latter medieval period, uh, Soviet period. Um, and in these pictures you see uh, Soviet stonemasons working on Tatev Monastery, which was being actively reconstructed through the 70s and 80s. Next slide. Uh, Soviet church, in the Soviet era, churches were also used as local utilitarian structures. Uh, many locals housed their agricultural goods in some of these medieval structures, as well as um, animals, and some even served as parking structures. Take, for example, the 17th century church of Surminas, located centrally in the village of Tatev. The interior held grains, while the exterior had white painted numbers that it indicated uh, designated parking spots for locals. Next slide. <clears throat> 
finally, uh, churches were sites of leisure. In my studies of Norvank and Tatev Monastery, almost every single family, local family, has a picture of themselves in the Soviet era, posing, relaxing, socializing in front of ruined or reconstructed facades of churches. Next slide. <clears throat> so in the Soviet era, just like in the medieval era, churches had multiple functions, yet they had a hard time overlapping. Um, and these kind of local uses of churches came at odds with state imaginings of churches as pristine uh, monuments. Take, for example, the medieval uh, stable in the monastery of Tatev, where up until part of the Soviet period, locals were housing animals inside. Uh, but when they decided to renovate the uh, monastery in the 70s, Soviet architects decided to put in a granite floor, which prevented this local continuation of use of putting animals or foodstuffs inside, and instead kind of transitioned it into a museum. So next slide. Uh, this Soviet fragmentation of usage of churches allowed for the splintering of usage in the post-Soviet era. With the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of neoliberal um, economies, many thousands of dollars poured into Armenia for the restoration of churches. Since the late 1990s and the early 2000s, churches have been at the center of um, developmental agendas that have social, political, and economic aspirations. But before I delve into these developmental agendas, I would like to point out that many medieval churches in the post-Soviet era have become working churches once again, working religious spaces. Yet, a statistic um, from 2011 showed that only 9.6% of respondents attended church on a weekly basis, and this number slightly goes up with 274 only attending on holy days. So churches have become more connected to issues of cultural identity rather than uh, being representative of religious adherence as most Armenians, local and diaspora, tend to only visit church on special holidays um, in order to uphold Armenian traditions. And perhaps the biggest way we can analyze this diaspora connection, uh, this connection to cultural identity is through the diaspora financing of churches. Um, so the reconstruction of Surp Asfazatsin Church, which you see to the right in the Norvant complex, was undertaken by a diaspora Canadian couple, couple in the late 1990s. Uh, they decided, the Hajitians decided to restore Norvank without having ever visited the site because they wanted to, they believed it was the utmost importance to uh, restore the vitality of the site and also to make it a working church once again. So uh, in essence, uh, <clears throat> an, an open neoliberal economy allows diaspora to actively reconnect with churches rather than being passive tourists. Um, and that, that also helps them reconnect with Armenia. Next slide. <clears throat> In fact, because the government has limited finances to contribute to heritage restoration each year, church reconstruction heavily relies on private donors. Um, in the recent decade, there have been efforts to pull tourism outside of Yerevan into local regions in Armenia, and this had made, has made tours, uh, churches uh, the central feature of development and tourism initiatives. The Tatev Revival Project, orchestrated by the IDEA Foundation, is a prime example of how a church is used um, as a um, kind of catalyst to reinvigorate a local region. New attractions like the world's longest aerial reversible ropeway and visitor complexes are meant to create jobs and local economy and to encourage locals to stay in the region rather than emigrating out to cities like Moscow and Yerevan. So the monastery then becomes a developmental hinge in which to invigorate contemporary lives. Yet the long-term effects of these projects, large-scale projects, have yet to be assessed. And sometimes when churches transform into tourism attractions, they merely become a checkbox on an itinerary, where to many tourists, they become indistinguishable from each other. Final slide. Next slide. Finally, churches have once again returned to their diplomatic roles, perhaps an iteration closest to their medieval usages. Recently, the U.S. Embassy in Armenia, through the Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation, has granted $450,000 to restore the frescoes and the foundations of chur uh, the Church of Surp Hovenes Mergajic slash Surp Sarkis in Mehri. This uh, big heritage project in Armenia is an example of cultural diplomacy, which political scientist Milton Cummings uh, quotes as the exchange of ideas, information, art, and other aspects of culture among nations and their peoples in order to foster mutual understanding, end quote. In general, heritage projects in Armenia are meant to show the softer side of U.S. diplomacy, where the U.S. government attempts to attract foreign publics through the funding of initiatives that show a friendly and culturally tolerant image of the United States. Um, 
Additionally, this is one of the first church restoration projects in Armenia funded by the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation, and it shows a U.S. awareness for the importance medieval churches play in the construction of contemporary Armenian identity and history. Additionally, the location of the chosen site near the border of Iran, where the U.S. has no formal diplomatic relations, seems strategic in a soft power sense. So in the Soviet era, just in the post-Soviet era, just like in the medieval and Soviet era, churches had, again, divergent function, uh, many different functions, but they diverged from the medieval and Soviet era as well. Um, but like in the Soviet era, they had a hard time overlapping. Take, for example, the Tatev Monastery. If you visit today, it's easy for a tourist with a camera who wanders into a church service to interrupt the Badrak or the echoing sounds of reconstruction to make it difficult for locals and diaspora to silently contemplate and connect with their heritage. So in this presentation, I've wanted to show how through the centuries, churches, uh, medieval churches have always um, molded and have been molded by social, political, and economic trends. And as Armenia moves into this end of transition era and out of it, uh, we can continue to analyze if these churches uh, continue to have effects on social, political realities, if they'll continue to evolve, or if they'll merely transition into frozen icons of a historic past. Last slide. Um, I would quick, like to quickly thank these organizations, the Gulbenkian Foundation, Bourne Fellowship, and the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology Center at Stanford for supporting my research through the years. Thank you.